So, Paul, to be in conversation with you is a treat for me this week. Uh, how are you? How are you doing today? I'm looking forward to it. I mean, yeah, I, I love. I love your show. I love your books. Um, I've loved the the recent conversations that we've had together. Um, you have such informed guests and with such sort of diverse and interesting perspectives. So um, this is uh, exciting and a little daunting. I know you're joining the hallowed ranks. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is going to be great. Um, but I'm going to kick off with the question that I ask all of my guests when they first come on the show, which is what do you think is going on in the global human psyche? And you can take that in any direction you want. Um, <laughs> no pressure. So I guess that, that does kind of bode the question, what is a global human psyche? Um, I guess the most empirical way of thinking about it would be to think of that as the sort of sum repository of all of the stories and narratives that are guiding our actions globally. Um, and I guess my first observation on that would be that the envelope of our individual awareness is such that we only have access to a portion of that global repository at any point in time. Mm. Um, and that that is going to look very different today for somebody in Sudan to New York to Barcelona or to Ukraine. Um, or even to Manchester. In fact, it might be very different for somebody on two different streets of Manchester. Um, and I, I do feel that at the moment, there is a lot in that global repository of narratives that is separating them. You know, if we think, you know, global governance, you know, you've got a security council made of members who now define themselves as enemies. You know, you've got broader calls for UN reform. You know, individual governments around the world are having to respond to the fact that, you know, partly through the rise of social media, they're responding to bases of support that are becoming more polarised. Um, economically, we're seeing a rising set of inequalities. You know, I think it's now you know, the eight wealthiest men in the world, only eight that have the same wealth as the bottom half of the global population. Environmentally, you know, we're being separated into people who can live safely where they are and people who are increasingly uh, in danger through extreme weather events, through drought, through air pollution, um, through lack of access to, to water. Um, socially, you know, there's the sort of loneliness pandemic following COVID. Um, technologically, you know, the, the potential for us to be put in danger by technology is, is rising rapidly. Um, so I think there's a lot of sort of a, a lot of instability uh, in those global stories. You know, we're having to reconsider even, you know, what is a human being? Yeah. I mean, what does it mean that I'm Paul and you're Natalie? You know, it turns out to be a, you know, perhaps more contingent than we were aware of when we were growing up. Um, you know, Tony Blair said the, uh, when he was prime minister, I remember him saying that the essential characteristic of the modern world was interconnectedness. Hmm. And I, I fear that sort of potentially the pendulum has swung and that the essential characteristic of that global psyche or the environment it's in is one of in, interdependence. Um, and it is a sort of extraordinary moment. You know, as Mike Berners-Lee put it to us in a, a marketing kind gathering, you know, throughout most of human history, there would have been nothing we could do to, to wreck the planet. You know, with the invention of nuclear weapons, there was something we could do to wreck major portions of it if we made a, a serious mistake. Today, you know, unless we actively change how we live and work, you know, we are closing down the planet's ability to be a safe and supportive home for us and i would go beyond you know what what mike said in that you know with the emergence of new technologies challenges of ai and so on um you know we we now are susceptible uh to destruction from uh overlooked risk mm. <laughs> you know it's the it's that sort of incidental repercussions of of our actions um, the sort of optimist in me hoped that the 
you know, the ultimate COVID vaccine from the pandemic would be learning from one global crisis, how to question everything and how to reform the stories driving how we live and work and what our priorities are, such that we'd be better equipped to handle future crises. And the the pessimist in me um, fears that, you know, maybe the things like the climate emergency will turn out with hindsight to have been a sort of failed dress rehearsal for coping with um uh, existential threats that that could evolve far more rapidly than than the climate emergency that we've had evidence of since 1938. Mm. Um, so I, I think there are some real challenges and some real needs to heal those stories and make them whole. And of course, you know, your work is a really significant part of that. So there is there is um, light at the end of that tunnel. <laughs> Well, thanks. That's high praise indeed. And I think I, I don't know how much can change through conversation, although actually I've been thinking about this quite a bit recently in terms of language and the power of story. And one of the things that was really significant to think about was the fact that, you know, the large language models that we have, the AI that offers such possibility, but also such threat is all predicated, mostly predicated on language. And so mm -hmm. even at that very sort of critical level how we relate to language and what we use to do what we choose to do with the conversations we have with the input of yeah. um, ideas whether that's training data or stories that we tell to one another through cultural means uh yeah we, we don't really think about our language as key but obviously it is it's how we've gotten to this place of um being able to build upon prior knowledge that's been stored and transmitted mm. through language um, and so one of the things that you pointed towards is the rapid transformation that's happening in the world of technology and how this is having a huge impact on our trajectory. Now, your work in the world of purpose and enterprise and organization is going to be impacted by this. And I think there's a really interesting vantage point from your perspective of exploring, well, you already sort of touched upon this, what it means to be human, what it means to orient ourselves perhaps towards purpose when there is so much challenge and uncertainty. And so could you maybe set a scene for what's unfolding right now from your perspective, thinking about technology and its impact on work and how we think about how we choose to make our money? In how we think about? How we choose to make a living, like how, how organisations organise themselves or how we relate oh, to our careers, so any direction. I, I think, I think that it certainly has implications for how we choose to make a living. And, and of course, you know, one aspect of purpose that we have to bear in mind is that purpose is an affordance of the environment. <laughs> so I'm not going to, you know, it, it's, people will make a living in the ways that are possible to them. You know, we don't have an infinite variety of choices. Yeah. And so if somebody, you know, whatever somebody needs to do to look after themselves, to look after their families, I think we have to recognize they're doing so. Choosing a pathway from a finite number of pathways and that that finite number of pathways is context specific. Mm. So I think that's a, f a first point. Um, I think that it is a real mind bender if you have the freedom to think about it, because, you know, we've become accustomed to the idea of having to pivot and change direction in careers and so on. You know, I think we've reached a point where we don't just need to reevaluate our own sort of the roles that we can play in the world. We need to also reevaluate our understanding of the world in which we're going to do our work in the first place. Yeah. And so I think that that's in incredibly um, important too. Um, and I think it is difficult because what are what is the nature of those affordances? If you're a young person today thinking of becoming a school teacher, what is a school teacher ten years from now? Yeah. <laughs> if you're thinking of becoming a lawyer, what is a, a lawyer five years from now? Um, so I think these are challenging uh, questions. Um, and, you know, perhaps for that reason, it, it can be very helpful to think about purpose as an adaptive capacity, you know, rather than something that is set in stone. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, 
you know, one instance that came to mind for me that I, I mentioned in, in my latest book was when my father came to visit me for a visit and a nice day out, but had a stroke. Mm. And of course, the purpose of the day changed instantly yeah. from having fun here to a, a 200 mile drive to take him to a specialist hospital because he was a heart transplant patient. So it was important to be in a in a particular hospital, not not just mm. whichever was was closest. I think of um, a line from uh, one of um, President Zelensky's speeches earlier in the invasion when he said, Ukraine didn't seek greatness, but Ukraine has become great. Mm. Um, and so I think something we need to recognise and that I've learned from working in the humanitarian sector in the field of disasters and emergencies is that often we are at our most purposeful mm. when things have gone wrong. When something unexpected has happened, that means we need to reprioritise altogether. And so I think we need to get considerably better at repurposing uh, around new priorities you know purpose isn't you know a north star is a nice analogy because you can navigate by it but a north star is also an inanimate object which is <laughs> fixed forever and the nature of um our problems as humans is that they're shifting around us we, you know we're part of an emergent wholeness and the relationship between us and our environment is going to change at every moment and so the optimal orientation may change as well. So um, hopefully one contribution I'm trying to make is f to help people see purpose as an adaptive capacity for humans, a renewable resource and enterprise, and that upgrading our purpose far from something that you wouldn't conceive of doing is something that is available to us at any point in time. So let's let's dig into what purpose means to you then, because I think it's something which people talk a lot about and like on TikTok and Instagram, these these terms get flung around and kind of become quite threadbare quite quickly. And so I'd love to ask, what does purpose mean to you? And for folks who are listening or watching, like, what's an entry point to exploring what that can be in ourselves? So I, there's a, <laughs> um, a wonderful um, uh, sketch um, was it Hennig Vane, I think, told the story. So he told the story of Hans, whose um, parents uh, became a bit concerned because Hans wasn't learning to speak. Um, and, uh, you know, at first they were relaxed, the months went by, but then the years began to go by and, you know, it got to his fifth birthday and they were re really quite distressed. Um, and then one day, all of a sudden, you know, the little five-year-old Hans this strudel is a bit tepid. <laughs> this strudel is a bit tepid. <laughs> uh, and his parents are sort of like, you know, Hans, you, we had no idea you could talk. If you could talk, why have you never said anything? Um, and his response was, up until now, everything was satisfactory. <laughs> <laughs> so in a sense, purpose begins with a problem to solve. You know, the, the reason we've evolved brains that enable language is because we have to move with intentionality, <laughs> you know, and, and I don't know about you, but I'm not going to out navigate a migratory bird. Um, <laughs> I am not going to out sprint a jaguar. Um, but human cognition allows us to think about where we've been, where we are and where we could get to sort of more conceptually as past, present and future. Mm. And human language enables us to narrate those as the beginnings, middles and ends of our stories. And those stories of purpose, this story that I could get to a better place, which is not just literal, but also in, you know, more abstract and imaginative now, mm. you know, it's those stories of a better that enable us to address our problems in more ambitious ways. And sort of as you alluded to a little earlier, um, it's that language that is ultimately um, enabled us not just to evolve as other species have done, um, but also to develop from generation to generation mm. you know, in ways that you know, are so radically transforming life and which has been a great evolutionary advantage to, to humans. But that capacity could also become our downfall mm. unless we're able to question it, unless we're able to adapt it, unless we're able to point it in a, in a fundamentally um, better direction. Um, so I guess that's a sort of a, 
macro view on <laughs> you know finding purpose with the nature of the problems we have to solve mm. um building it out through the most meaningful solutions that we can to those problems mm. and then reaching outcomes where we know that any individual out outcome is not the end <laughs> but yeah. is you know one stop on on route to a further destination so um we can never subjugate everything to a particular end otherwise you end up with totalitarianism dictatorship mm. and and just wrong ever greater yeah. magnitudes of wrong <laughs> <laughs> And I think one of the things that really um, strikes me when you're talking about how purpose shows up when there's a problem, it's kind of that friction point between, I guess, this sort of state of, of comfort and satisfactory uh, context, like the, the story of Hans. And then that part, that part where, and you hear this quite a bit, people talk about the midlife crisis, and it's, it's such an interesting use of language around something which I think is potentially a, a kind of... Um, in some people, an unavoidable reappraisal of what they're doing with their life, given that there's right. not an infinite amount of time to live. And so I wonder, are there ways to orient yourself towards the exploration of what purpose could be, both on an individual and collective level, before we hit these crisis points? Because, you know, if, you're, if your parent suddenly falls ill and is sort of at that veil of life and death, or maybe someone has an accident or they lose their home, you know, these points where there's there's really a, a soul searching that has to come from it. Are there ways to kind of preemptively start the search so that it doesn't have to be until those moments that we then kind of reassess where we're at? Wow, so this, this is it's interesting. Maybe that's a big assumption. It's interesting well. <laughs> to ask me about the challenge of a, a midlife crisis and questioning where you've been going because just in um on saturday <laughs> it's not only my next birthday which is a, a much bigger number than i would like it to be <laughs> um but it is also um a gaudy a, a, a sort of long-term reunion uh celebration at my college at my university uh -huh. um so i feel kind of raising this question just as I've got that in a few days you've you suddenly sort of <laughs> triggered some some questioning there I hope um, not too much stress <laughs> I yeah uh, but it, apart from that um I, I think sort of life story is really important to us you know so um you know we've evolved these stories you know like Hans there wasn't a need to speak until there was a problem to solve mm. um, and our stories really are problem solving devices mm. I mean construing you as Natalie makes you the same person I meet today as I met yesterday mm. which makes it a little easier for us to build trust and there's an element of predictability and mutual support becomes available if I had to contend with you as a completely different being or without that assumption um you know it, it would be an exciting rediscovery but um <laughs> you know it would be a little trickier um and you know in behavioral psychology we know that actually although rationally somebody might rather have a good life than a good life story because our narrative competence is such an important part of our evolution and development and the outcomes we get in life, in practice, we tend to gravitate towards good life story options mm -hmm. over and above good life outcome options. I mean, some of the research showing this is things like um, duration neglect, where people tend to evaluate um, a life that is 50 years that are very happy and five years that are just happy. Mm. They tend to associate that with less well-being than just 50 years that are very happy, for example. Mm -hmm. When, of course, an extra five years of happiness is is better. Yeah. Um, so those life stories are really important to us. And I, I think that, you know, to contend with having to renew and change and adapt those stories, I think that does take an extra toll. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have to accept that sometimes we're not going to be able to pursue efficiency. You know, efficiency is the replication of something to an, an ever greater scale. And it can be useful, but it's different to effectiveness. And sometimes effectiveness is more important than efficiency. 
you know, when we think about bed usage in the NHS at the start of the pandemic, you know, the fact that the NHS had been very efficient in bed use compared to other health systems meant that money wasn't being wasted on empty beds. But what happens when all the beds are needed at the same time? Effectiveness, you know, that efficiency was perhaps earned at the expense of effectiveness. Yeah. So I think we may need to sort of cut ourselves a bit of slack um, and recognise that we're going to have to you know, invest some effort into recreating our stories and to allowing those stories to evolve over time. Mm. It's interesting. One of the things that I don't really speak too publicly about just because of the general context, but I'm very interested in, in personal conversations, is this attachment that seems to be very prevalent, especially in kind of social media domains around identity, around labelling, around almost like a fixedness of this is how I would like you to relate to me and to be seen. And I think obviously identity is really important and it speaks to the things that we cherish, that we value, that we want to express in the world to a set of perspectives or ethics. It's bound up in a lot of richness, but it does seem to me like there's this kind of, that our attachment to specific identities can really inhibit our potential for discovery, for growth, for exploration beyond the bounds of what we already know. Yeah. Um, and couple, coupling that with the fact that so many of the predictive platforms that we work with are based on historic data, I, I, I yeah. worry about this calcification and narrowing of possibilities yeah. that we're being trained in, that also we're then imposing upon ourselves that reduce our potential to change, to adapt, to experiment, um, and to be open in those ways. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that, but I'd love to hear if you Yeah, do. so Montaigne, the French essayist, who sort of coined the word essay, so if you happen to have any students listening, then he's the one to blame. <laughs> um, and he said, you know, if you accept my assumptions, I can convince you of anything. Hmm. And the, the point about assumptions is that if you stay within them, you know, there's only one way to go, and that's ever ever deeper. So I think we do need to challenge those assumptions. And it comes back to your earliest um you know question really in terms of the global psyche if we accept the way that i chose to construe a global psyche as the repository of stories so you know we can only think really about one story at a time you know we might you might kind of be trying to second guess me now and seeing if you can think of two and you might be able to temporarily but it would be a bit of a strain and as soon as you can you'll relinquish that so we have sort of one part of a narrative in front of our minds um and it's calorically expensive to process that. So when we can, we relegate that to our subconscious so that we can get on with fulfilling that part of the story. So, you know, once I've chosen to do A, I then can relegate that. I know that's what I'm going to do. So I get on with B, which is, you know, okay, how am I going to do that? You know, and then see what, what comes up along the way. Um, and of course, you know, once those narratives are in our subconscious, that's great for efficiency, enabling us to, to focus. And, you know, we see the world through a lens that reduces in an infinite perceptual field to a relative perceptual field that is useful to that purpose. Um, but then if circumstances change and we're not able to question the parts of the narrative that we've already relegated, mm. um, then that very sort of valuable conscious lens becomes a dangerous set of unconscious blinkers and that can you know, blind us to more important realities. Often, uh, preventing us from taking necessary action where the need for that action comes from something that is hidden in the shadow of that initial closing down of the perceptual field. So yes, to give a couple of concrete examples, you know, I've listened to a fire chief in New York City saying that actually if you go around bars on a, uh, in New York and where there's a fire, as a fire, fire service, the typical problem that you encounter um, is not that people are panicking, knocking each other out the way, knocking over bar stools and running to the exit. The problem is that unless the flames or the smoke are actually in the room that people are sitting in when the order for evacuation comes in, is that, you know, the response is, happy to move, but can, can, can we just finish our drinks first? <laughs> um, so we tend not to respond well to threats that come from outside the frame that we've created for yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Um, if that addresses the point. Yeah, no, that's a really good example as well. It's weird how we do that. Um, okay, so I want to I want to get to your brilliant book, <clears throat> The Purpose Upgrade, which I will provide links to in the show notes. 
So change the world to save your business. And it actually, I just saw on your website, because I was doing a bit of snooping around, um, that it won the highly commended category in change and sustainability for the 2023 Business Book Awards, which is very exciting. So massive congratulations and well deserved. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I think it speaks not only to the brilliance of the book, but also to the poignance of this moment, how relevant it is to the point where we find ourselves now. So I'm curious, what led you to write it? Um. So, well, I count myself as a reader more than a writer. So it's my second book. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, as you can see from the shelves behind me, I've spent a lot more time reading than writing. So I only <laughs> write books um, when I feel I absolutely have to. Um, and uh, sort of in a sense, with both the books, it was the same fundamental point. My sense was that the prevailing narratives... Uh, with the first book around strategy and with the second book around purpose were uh, narratives that had shadows that were coming to undermine their very validity. Mm -hmm. So in the case of you know the first book, I tackled the notion of competitive advantage and felt that it misconstrued the value creation process um, and so proposed collaborative advantage as a radical alternative. And in the second book, you know, it's sort of in a little bit... Um, comes back to what I was saying about disasters and emergencies. Mm. You know, the prevailing idea that purpose is fixed, either as maximizing shareholder value for you know one crowd or as a north star of elevated purpose for another crowd. You know, it, both of those um, have the limitation of being fixed. Mm. Um, and my sense from working in the field of disasters and emergencies, amongst others, but there was it was just particularly tangible there, is the fact that you know, when faced with disasters and emergencies, often instead of falling apart, communities actually become really purposeful, you know, mm. help each other out in unprecedented ways, find new reserves of strength, um, rebuild in ways that are better. I mean, you know, we talked about Ukraine a moment ago. Um, to give, um, to make an upbeat observation, one thing that's really exciting about um, what, what the Ukrainians are able to do is, you know, they're developing out of necessity mechanisms of of digital government you know e-passports and wow. you know a whole range of um sort of next generation approaches to how to look after your citizens that i think they'll be able to export and lead the world in for mm. some time to come um you know as, as we move to a, a redevelopment phase well wow. Okay, so there's lots to unpack. One of the things that I think would be nice to sort of anchor ourselves in, and it was one of the striking quotes that is right at the very beginning of the book, um, and I'm going to quote you here if that's okay, was fulfilling true human need rather than manufacturing spurious consumerist wants has become the biggest business opportunity of our time. I mean, that for me, it's like a knockout point. Can you unpack it for us a bit? Yeah, so I think it was in... In, was it in, I think, 1929, somebody called Paul M. Mazur, um, a Wall Street banker, put it to the Harvard Business Review that we needed to evolve, this was the American, needed, business needed to evolve from a culture of uh, meeting needs to a culture of manufacturing desires. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that, in a sense, you could see as the sort of the wake up call for the, you know, the decades of marketing that ensued um and i feel just as you know in a sense we've moved from a world of interconnectedness to a world of interdependence although those two obviously sort of overlap i feel the pendulum is swinging back the other way mm -hmm. and we need to um get back to addressing fundamental needs rather than just stimulating desires and that you know, for our profession in, in marketing or, or more broadly as people who use narrative to, to open the doors to a better shared future, said sh sets of futures, is that we need to go from making the attractive necessary to making the necessary attractive. Mm. And I think that's really quite a, a profound shift that may cause us to have to think differently about you know, the structure, the organisations, the whole discipline, the way that we bring, you know, marketing and narrative based approaches to strategy and leadership to life as a, as a result of that. 
I think something that's quite interesting about that is that it challenges, again, going back to the theme of assumptions, some of our most basic assumptions about, you know, what are we doing this business for? Who benefits? Does there need to be something beyond just the profit imperative? Um, and I'm curious from that perspective, perhaps what you conceive of as success both as a sort of a personal thing, but also at an organizational level, what does success mean to you? So I think, <laughs> <laughs> so that there's sort of, sort of two really big juicy questions in there. Um, so I think, in, first of all, the question is in terms of purpose and profit, then I think something that you know, business leaders can take comfort in and something I try and do in the book um, is to show that whereas, you know, in, in conventional economic thinking, since Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, we've had the view that if you pursue self-interest first, you end up with collective good as the happy byproduct. Mm. And of course, people have been increasingly quipping that the invisible hand may be invisible because it's not really there. And we know <laughs> that there are limits to that way of thinking. Um, but I argue that there is both reason sort of fundamental reason and also evidence to suggest that we're better off turning that upside down and that if we seek to create benefits for others first we are then more likely to derive our own self-directed rewards as the mm. the happy uh, outcome um, by making our businesses a channel for something greater than themselves you know, we can take our share of the far greater overall wealth of what I call not wealth of nations, but wealth of change that that unlocks. So in a sense, you know, there is an optimistic message for, for business. And the rationale is simply that if you seek to maximize profits, that's a, a very narrow focus through which to ideate. It doesn't really yeah. help you. Whereas if you seek to be useful to your stakeholders, then a subset of the things that you come to perceive will end up being, you know, rewarding for you and will mm. reveal profitable opportunities that might otherwise have been hidden from view. But you also asked, this is going to be a long answer, but you it's also asked, what does success mean for me? And I think, you know, one of the things I'm bringing out is that success is not a fixed end point, mm -hmm. but something that can be changed. So I'm going to say, what does success mean for me? I'm going to say, be more Prussian. So <laughs> okay. um, in the um, Prussian, after the Prussian invasion by Napoleon, the Prussian government in exile um, needed to raise money for an uprising against Napoleon, which became the War of Liberation. Mm -hmm. um, now, their masterstroke was, well, they, they asked the aristocrats to send in all their gold and silver jewellery to fund the uprising. Yeah. The masterstroke part of it um, was that they then sent back replicas of that jewellery, <laughs> um, not made of gold and silver, but made of iron, which came to be known as Berlin iron, and with patriotic slogans engraved in it, you know, which meant that overnight, um, aristocrats could no longer sort of lord it over each other and everyone else with their magnificent gold and silver jewellery. <laughs> if anything, that looked disgraceful. But actually wearing your Berlin iron was, you know, a, a way to get on in social circles. Wow. Um, and so in a sense, I think we need to get more Prussian in that, you know, letting go of an outmoded vision of success, particularly when we can find ways so that, you know, we're all in, in we're all involved, you know, we're all in the same position, mm. can actually be a relief rather than a burden. And embracing a new vision of success can be exciting you know not 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 just daunting mm -hmm. um so you know i think you know when it, one of the sort of happier moments of the of the uh, pandemic if you can say happy moments but it varied a lot according to what situation people are in domestically mm -hmm. of course but for a good number of people you know the early parts of lockdown where you would go out into nature for your once a day exercise <laughs> you know and abandoning the commute and so on there was a sort of relief to it yeah. an ability to embrace something new for a moment that a lot of people actually enjoyed in, in, in those early weeks. Um, and I, I think that, you know, being more Prussian could actually 
expand the range of opportunities for fulfillment and happiness that are available to us. Mm. It's interesting because it's uh, connecting very well to another question I had for you, which is connected to how in the book, one of the elements that you address is our ability to create more collectively ambitious narratives. So thinking about not just the individual, but the group a shared purpose that not only aligns the various stakeholders, but also creates a possibility for entire ecosystems of actors to progress, benefit, develop. And so I'd like to ask, especially when it comes to highly individualistic societies like in the UK and the US and elsewhere, how can we begin to make this transition of perception, maybe also storytelling from the I to the we without thinking about, okay, that just means now we're going to become communists or socialists, but what can we do to reorient ourselves towards a more interconnected well-being and the thriving? Yeah. Um, so the economist John Maynard Keynes said in the long run, we're all dead. I, I think I'd <laughs> like to update that proposition and yes. suggest that you know, in the long run, we're all aligned. Um, and so, you know, some of the biggest challenges of today revolve around having the wrong perception or the wrong making inappropriate usage of time and space. Hmm. You know, if you think about de democracy, a lot of the decisions that, you know, a lot of the activity that has biggest impact on us isn't necessarily within one nation state. Yeah. Um, if you think about timeline, a lot of the um, responses that we need to make to our most serious problems are not things that necessarily can be achieved within one electoral cycle. Mm. You know, businesses, you know, giving earnings reportings on a, on a quarterly basis mm. are going to overlook. I mean, there was one study I came across um, purporting to show that the more financial analysts you have looking at a particular sector, the fewer patents get filed in that sector because wow. it can be off-putting to, you know, long, longer term investment. So I think that, you know, one way is to to play around with the variables of our perceptual field and to, hmm. to adjust our sense of time and, and space. Um, I think we are all heavily so interconnected in ways so I'm, I'm not sure there is really an individualistic um society i mean you know right now i'm getting to talk to you i have no I'm, i can connect to this system yeah. forget i forget what it's called riverside, riverside. <laughs> um but i've no idea how the packets of information that my voice produces get captured by the microphone and taken mm -hmm. from my laptop to yours and mm -hmm. If I had the challenge of making all that happen from scratch, it, 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 I, I'd need to, we'd have to have faith in reincarnation because <laughs> it would be quite some time before that <laughs> happened. So often it's about surfacing <laughs> things that are there and finding new ways to align for mutual and reciprocal um, benefit mm -hmm. that thinks about our problems through an expanded context that builds solutions that you know, recognize the diversity of narratives available um, and reaches outcomes that are more inclusive um, and that we aim towards, but in the knowledge that as we progress, you know, we'll see greater peaks to climb behind it. Mm. But I think for that kind of stance to happen, there's also this, one of the challenges, one of many challenges is this mindset of scarcity and the experience of precarity and the sense of there's a finite amount of resources. How are we going to make sure that our family and our crew are kind of looked after? Um, that being said, obviously, I mean, you mentioned earlier how in times of great distress, people do tend to come together rather than splinter apart, depending on the political context and the rest of it. Mm. Mm. So I think the next question I want to ask, thinking about these sorts of contexts um, for change, is something that you write about in your book around states of emergence and you, you outline kind of a model yeah. where we look at how we can move beyond more extractive consumerism towards a world of greater value and meaning creation. Yeah. What are some of the key principles that you feel are most vital to this kind of transformation or orientation? Yeah, and, and I want to try and do two, I want to answer the question, and somehow, if I can, I want to pick up on, because I sensed in when you talked about communities pulling together if they can, mm -hmm. there was an element of, is that really what's happening? I kind mm -hmm. of sensed in you. And I think that's that's quite 
a, an interesting sense to pick up on. So I want to do two together. So first of all, in the state of emergence, the first point to make most fundamentally is that in a sense, you set the upper limit on success when you choose what problem you're in the business of solving. <laughs> okay, and so reframing your perception of the problem can be one of the most powerful ways to add value to an individual stream of activity, an enterprise, an economy, whatever it might be. You know, that, that reframing is important. In terms of emergence, you know, we are interconnected and interdependent. You know, we are part of a greater wholeness. Um, and that wholeness is always on the move. Hmm. So the good news, if you think that finding more valuable problems to solve can add the great, greater value than just finding an ever better way to solve a previously understood problem, you know, the good news is that you know our emergent complexity is never going to stop presenting the potential for for new problems to solve or new ways of seeing prior problems to solve. I think one of the challenges, because I want to also pick up on what I perceived as a slight reticence in terms of <laughs> communities pulling together in difficult times mm. um, is that, you know, a particular challenge we currently face is what the, the World Economic Forum and Adam Tooze, the historian, have called the poly crisis, mm -hmm. you know, which is where you have multiple crises together such that the whole becomes less than the sum of the parts in terms of what you've got going for you. And we saw this you know, yesterday with the beginning of the, the, the COVID inquiry, the recognition that a diminution of resilience in the, sorry to be UK, so you've got such a global audience. No, so but that's fine. It, you know, in the UK, there is a COVID inquiry. And um, you know, one of the starting premises is that a diminution of resilience that had come about from a period of austerity meant that we were less well prepared to contend with the pandemic when it hit us. Mm. And I think that is where I, I do think that we naturally pull together around problems. Um, I think there is the notion of what is together. And, you know, when there is increasing separation, that's a diminution of resilience. So I, I think that we have to really, um, I think, you know, the historians who take a data centric approach have warnings to give to societies that become too separated and unequal. Yeah. Um, and when you look at global inequality, when you look at the differences in terms of how the climate emergency and the collapse of nature systems and water scarcity and consequences for um, growing food affect different people in different parts of the world so differently, um, and then have implications that reach all around the world and affect all people in all societies in ways that are very different depending on their, their circumstances. I, I do think that in terms of purpose and priorities, we've got to create a safe, supportive home and we have to include more people in the benefits of what we're doing. Otherwise, you know, real danger does lie ahead. Mm. I was thinking also about in terms of context where there have been conditions in which more authoritarian forms of power have been able to succeed and to rise and take hold. And then the division that can happen when groups are pitted against one another. And then what does it actually mean to feel a sense of kinship and belonging when mm. you're absolutely terrified that you might get ousted or you might get, um, I'm thinking particularly with sort of, world wars or when religious groups are identified and then cast aside this sort of thing. So there's also that political element. And now with um, just to add to the poly crisis mix in the cauldron, when we think about things like the the potential for deep fakes to be so easily and convincingly produced and propagated, there's, there's the other question of well, what the hell do we do when we can't actually decipher what's real and what's not in an already overwhelmed informational landscape where you're basically trying to drink from a water hose and then to not even realize i don't know that there's it's a really um it feels like such a tumultuous time and i feel like we're just tipping into it so many folks are already expressing a sense of overwhelm and mm. we haven't even really tipped beyond the threshold yet at least that's my feeling on the matter i don't know what your sense is uh, yeah, I mean, is it going back to the, the first question you asked, my sense is that there is an instability mm -hmm. to the, the sort of sum total of stories that we have as the heuristics that, that guide us through life. Mm -hmm. and there is an inherent instability to that at the moment. 
Um, and there can be a desire to cling on hmm. when things are unstable. Um, and it may be that some of the time we also need to know how to let go and recreate. It's interesting, hmm. actually, I haven't, haven't got around to reading it yet, but my latest book purchased um, is um, a book called The, the Time Shelter. Just happened Ooh. to have it on, on my desk, looking at me appealingly. Um, <laughs> and uh, the it's a Bulgarian novel, and the the premise is that um, uh, a character creates a library of a sort of museum of the past mm. for people who are affected with Alzheimer's. Wow, and that's really interesting because you know Alzheimer's you lose your stories, of course, and so mm -hmm. you know that is just so acutely relevant to everything we've been saying today. Um, but what's interesting in, in the premise of the story is that people who don't have Alzheimer's are seeking to enrol themselves in, in, in living and visiting this museum of the past so that they can ex re-experience life in prior decades. Hmm. Um, and so I think there is a, a sort of desire to, to, to cling on. Um, and in certain circumstances, you know, that's right. Um, but we also need to get better at letting go and renewal. And you, you talk about totalitarianism. The um, philosopher Hannah Arendt said that mm. the final um, strength of democracy over totalitarianism is the capacity for renewal. Mm. Um, and so I think that's what we need to heal ourselves with. Mm. So I don't usually go down this track I think, but I'm kind of tempted to ask you and feel free not to not to answer. But um, the way that you talk about emergence and interconnection, potentially into being and sensing, I'm wondering if you have a spiritual practice or some form of relating to the world or cosmovision that orients you towards this sense of renewal and adaptation and purpose, because you speak in a way that sounds to me quite... Um, there's sort of threads of the sacred in there somehow. That's possible. I mean, so I I, I do sort of consciously um, make an attempt to be aligned with both reason and evidence. Mm. So I am perhaps more of an empiricist <laughs> than than you might think. <laughs> um, I do. So you know, one way to renew our narratives is to have the capacity to step outside them. So if we think about evolution, you know, the, the period of our evolution in which we've had complex narratives that we have today is, is a tiny fraction of even human civilization, really. Um, human civilization is a tiny fraction of the evolution of humankind. Um, and humankind is a tiny fraction of the evolution of the biological systems that we evolved from. Mm. You know, so we're talking about, you know, maybe a, a couple of hundred years out of four billion. <laughs> and so, you know, we could say 10,000 if, if, if we want to um, claim that in some ways linguistic complexity had, you know, had its own challenges throughout that period. Um, but it's still tiny. And so I think one way that we can renew is to step outside of a constant exposure to those narratives to get mm. back to a sort of preconceptual thought. Um, and so I have meditated every day since university day, since mm. my last year of university, or since before my last year at university. I had a year abroad, as so I did French and Spanish. Mm -hmm. So that definitely has been a, a profound shaper. Um, I think there are other things we can do in that regard. Um, there's an increasing prevalence of cancer among young people. Hmm. Um, it's the fastest growing rate of, um, of uh, cancer diagnoses is, is among, I think, 25 to 35 year olds Oof. and millennials are getting it more. And, you know, some of the speculation is changing in nutrition patterns that came in from the 1960s onwards. Other speculation is that um, it could be driven by an increasing propensity to be exposed to electric light and screens, you know, oh, late wow. into the night. And it's true that being aligned with the cycles of nature, even if it is quite simply, you know, closing down when it gets dark and opening up when it gets light, 
has a tremendous bearing on our cognition. Mm -hmm. And I think with any of these things, you know, we're thinking about well-being, resilience, thinking of the future more imaginatively. I often say start with biology because mm -hmm. you know, biology gives us the raw materials psychology pushes off in a different direction according to the state of being that you're in yeah um and so if you raise your biological renewal then the starting point you know the direction that your the trajectory of your psychology improves and then of course you can rescript very valuable but from a better starting point is more felicitous and then you move on to how does that drive your interrelations into being, how can you design an environment that is conducive to that? So I think mm -hmm. there is a, a spirituality there. I mean, there's a, a, when I said I tend to be em empirical, um, I would like to sort of fully embrace sort of nations, you know, I believe you have some expertise in union archetypes. Um, <laughs> I'm very interested in sort of some of the ancient traditions like, you know, the Vedic or Hindu tradition on Atma as the individual soul being part of Brahman, being part of a universal consciousness. Um, and I'm, I think that those things make a lot of intuitive sense if you meditate and I think that the practices they give rise to are incredibly healing and restorative. Mm. You know, at the same time, if you talk to a neuroscientist, then currently there is no empirically observable phenomenon that requires the existence of those things as an explanation. So mm. we have to be careful and that's why i say i tend to root anything i say in in in, in reason and in empiricism to a reasonable degree but intuitively and um in, in many ways i'm very open to embracing um the lessons that can be learned from spiritual traditions fascinating that went into a very interesting place <laughs> okay so grounding it just a little bit because you've got about 10 minutes left of this section before we go to the quick fire round. Um, <laughs> I'm dreading. I, I'm not really a quick fire kind of guy. <laughs> it doesn't have to be quick fire. If we get through three questions, then that's plenty. <laughs> it's, it's more than that. I'm genuinely nervous as to what quick fire questions almost usually. Well, I, I only usually hear them put to other people. And oh, I always I see. feel that in their shoes, I would have just been utterly stumped. <laughs> So if anyone likes quality, move on to the next episode. And if you don't, if you like Jeopardy, uh, stay tuned because there's some of it coming up. Is it, to be fair, it's not like quick fire. It's more like gentle, shorter questions. I should just rename it because you're right. The construct creates all sorts of expectations around how it's going to be. Um, but before we get to that bit, I want to ask you one question, which is obviously sort of central to your book, because I feel like we need to include it. I'd like to hear sort of some more talk about it so you talk about enterprise's role in society and mm -hmm. you also give some really fascinating case studies or examples of big corporate turnarounds like these you know big old ships that sort of turn their course and are able to to achieve remarkable things and so i'd really love to ask if there's a particular story or case study that for you typifies how enterprise can fulfill a more flourishing role in society for the betterment of all yeah, and I, I have no hesitation here in in turning to Fika Sibisma. <laughs> he was perhaps the most inspiring person um, that I talked to in in writing the book. So he was CEO of a business called DSM in in one of its most defining periods. I also spoke to the the current co CEOs as well, who were also you know fantastic, and others in the in the leadership team. Um, but Fika Sibisma was responsible for a major turnaround. Um, he ha actually had studied biology and so he sort of bought into the notion that it's not the strongest or the biggest survive, but the most those who are most able to adapt. Um, and I see repurposing as the next stage of the evolution of enterprise. You know, in environments of change, we learn to innovate with contemporary communications environment, we learn not just to innovate, but to transform mm. our organizations and how they work. And I think that as human need gets sort of jolted around in <laughs> such radically different directions in different contexts with things happening so quickly and having unexpected implications, I think we need to get much better 
you know, at recognizing our opportunities are interconnected, our threats are interdependent, and fundamentally not just innovating and transforming, but repurposing our organizations. Um, now, DSM is really interesting because it's a, a global sustainable food business, hmm. which began life um, as a coal mining business. Wow. You know, so DSM originally stood for Dutch State Mines, and the company was born from digging coal out of the ground and delivering it to people's homes for heating uh, and illumination. Um, but DSM now stands informally for Do Something Meaningful. Um, <laughs> and in making that fundamental transition, perhaps the most significant portion of which, um, you know, because it was a long, the most significant portion of which was likely under FICA's leadership, um, to becoming, you know, a, a champion of sustainable goals. Um, you know, current goals and corporate objectives include things like, you know, closing the micronutrient gap of 500 um, million people, wow. um, improving the livelihoods of over 500 smallholder farmers. And these are people often working in some of the most precarious conditions around the world, um, reaching 150 million people with alternative proteins, you know, rather than meat, reducing wow. climate emissions on farms. Um, and so in making that transition, I, I think DSM is really a powerful metaphor or exemplar of the kinds of purpose upgrade that we need to see across the economy and society as a whole. You know, mm. coal mining was perfectly respectable when DSM <laughs> was born. It's now problematic and DSM yeah. was repurposed. Um, and I think a lot of what we do on a daily basis is now becoming problematic yeah. and we need to repurpose around a, a changed context. Okay. So thinking about all the challenges that we've got, um, the poly crisis, as you mentioned earlier, that we have to kind of find ways to adapt to and be resilient to and get creative with. How do you orient yourself towards life and beauty and um, I guess sort of wholeness on dark days? What keeps you going? Yeah, I have a, an old um, Spanish professor who specialised in research in San Juan de la Cruz and <laughs> he wrote the poem, the um, dark night of the soul and he offer, he was said he was always waiting for the day that a student would come in um, and as their excuse for not doing their weekly essay would say that they'd experienced a dark night of the soul. <laughs> I think probably the, the darkest night of the soul for me would be contemplating the potential non-existence of a soul. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so in terms of life, art and beauty, um, I'm going to go back to stories. So there's actually the, you know, the, we're all familiar with um, um, Descartes' line, you know, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. <laughs> and there's actually a, a part B that people don't tend to talk about, which is the, you know, the second part of the proposition, dubito ergo deus est. You know, I have doubts, <laughs> therefore God must exist. And, and, and I think we can take that in a broader sense of there are limit. I know, you know, I have knowledge, therefore I must exist, but there is a limit to my knowledge. Therefore, there must be a greater intelligence or knowledge that lies beyond what I currently know. And I think for me, the aesthetic is a lot to do with that beyond. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, if you think, you know, one of the best works of literary criticism of all time um, was a book called Mimesis, which is means replication or imitation from it's the it's the Greek version of imitatio, the replication, and it was written by a, a Jewish academic called Eric Auerbach, and um, he wrote it in very difficult circumstances because mm. he was literally fleeing from the Nazis while writing it, so he had very limited access to academic resources, very difficult conditions in which to write, and he wrote a book with a chapter on each of a variety of magnificent authors. Mm. Um, and it's, you know, in each chapter, he takes one passage and then expands it to the book as a whole and gets to the essence of how that author represented the world. Mm. And it is beautiful and it's worth reading. It's worth digging out today. I think you know, it's still regarded as one of the best books ever written <laughs> about literature, even though it was written so many decades ago. Um, but there's another way of construing stories. Um, you know, there was another, it's interesting, 
the, the, I came across the phrase recently, you'll probably know who it was because it was somebody working on in AI um, who said that we now need to update our philosophy with a deadline because of <laughs> AI and we need to really think a lot of fundamentals through. Um, and, but some of this, you know, thinking is done in the time of classical antiquity and there was another way of construing stories in um the thinking about rhetoric which was the <laughs> idea of anagnorosis the idea of revelation or disruption and so one way of thinking about stories is that they represent the world and reading my Mises by eric auerbach you sort of are lulled into a just a sort of surrender to beauty <laughs> um but another way of thinking about stories is that actually the new story contains something which disrupts our prior story which mm. reminds us that the map of the world or the model of the world that we have so far used language to develop and that is in our psyche as part of a collective or global psyche contains some non-truth mm. evidently because it's relative you know it is not and it is not absolute um and therefore there is a new truth, a, a greater truth to embrace, uh, and that you can experience as a sort of mini miracle, because what you previously thought was a rule is now is now disruptable. It's now no longer a rule. What, what was previously a boundary is now porous, and mm. you can move beyond it. And so I think there is something in the aesthetic of showing us a beyond that we can embrace. Um, and I think that that might be one of the sort of most beautiful experiences in in life. You know, not that, but this. Mm. Wonderful. OK, so before we move to the, the additional bit, where are the best places for people to find out about you and both your books and the work that you do and marketing kind, which you haven't had a chance to catch up on but i will include that also in the notes for people to okay in. so my books are available on amazon in waterstones in good bookshops and in bad bookshops so <laughs> purpose upgrade change your business to save the world change the world to save your business collaborative advantage how collaboration beats competition as a strategy for success people can find me on linkedin i'm relatively responsive um, and uh, I suppose one way that people can really embrace what I do, I, I also do advisory work on helping organizations define and mobilize around purpose. Um, but something that people can step into and where we'll be welcoming you, of course, in a, in a couple of weeks is Marketing Kind. And so just briefly on that, um, we are a community of marketers and change makers who believe that the world's most pressing problems depend on human cooperation to be solved even more fundamentally than they do on finance or technology. Um, and so we are a membership community. We upcycle our business and marketing skills to support charities and social enterprises and build a sort of portfolio of social and environmental impacts and change in so doing together. Um, we coach and support each other in becoming more systemic leaders in the day jobs through our digital firesides, through our Your Marketing Kind gatherings. Um, and we also dig into and explore some of the bigger stories that shape how we live, work and play and how we might change those stories for the better and bring in you know, a lot of our heroes into those um, conversations uh, with us. So anyone um, would be welcome to... Um, Join us at Marketing Kind.